First and foremost, I'm a wife. Secondly, I'm a very proud mum. Thirdly, um, I'm a working girl and I always have been. I started working when I was very young, around 14, 15 years old. My first job was uh, promoting stiletto lawnmowers in the Hyperama in Pretoria. I've always wanted to earn my own money. I've always wanted to be self-sufficient and never wanted to rely on anybody else. And and it's it's something that just has driven me all my life. I've just I've loved being busy and I've loved being fiercely independent. I matriculated when I was 17 and said I would never open another book in my life. I managed to get a position at Nedbank at a branch in Pretoria and I started off actually answering the switchboard <laughs> and then quickly progressed to managing the student loans and assisting on the student loans. And I went and enrolled for a degree and I got my degree majoring in English psychology and sociology. So I got an opportunity to interview at Panasonic. It was for client liaison officers. I really wanted to be in a global firm and my time as client liaison officer was very short-lived. I very quickly fast-tracked and um, moved into a position within their PR department. And I ended off being the PR manager for their business systems division. I think I was at the Panasonic for eight years. And that's also when I had, I had my first uh, professional mentor, a lady by the name of Alex Garlick, who in those days was the CEO of Gray's Advertising, which was just the, the agency. And she said to me, Dot, you are going to soon be in a position of power. And you need to know how dangerous that is. You can ruin people's lives with the power you've got, and you've got to use it very, very carefully. And that's a lesson I never forgot. So as my career grew and as I became more powerful, I became very much aware of that power and what it did to companies or to people. And I really tried to, in all my dealings, safeguard that and not abuse it. And then a, a headhunter approached me and she said, no, no, which which salient and network do you want to go to so that, so that we can place you? Because that's the next part of your journey. So I just immediately said, no, I, I, I want to go to Vodacom. I was there from the 1st of um, April, 1994. And the first thing that they did is they had a, a test network for the uh, elections. Oh my word. And living in Pretoria, I was at home with my sister and we could hear the planes flying over and we were watching it on TV. And we just said, no, this is ridiculous. We, we, we've got to be there. So we hopped into her little, uh, she had a little blue fork seat and we hopped into the fork seat and we raced to the union building. There were just police everywhere. I stopped and I said to the police or the soldiers, I said, do you want to phone home? And then they said, what do you mean phone home? I said, here, yeah, I've got this device that you can phone anywhere phone your mother. It was just so incredible to see these young people phoning home using this first technology at the first democratic inauguration. I was 33 when I fell pregnant with my son. I had a lovely pregnancy, but it was, it, it got more and more difficult the closer it came. And I think the first time I felt Matthew move inside me, I was struck in that Here's something inside me that I can't control. I was thrust into a position of having to do something I wasn't equipped to do. I had this little newborn. I didn't know how to hold him. Even though you've gone for all the classes, they actually don't teach you anything. And I think that's why postpartum depression can be such a massive thing for career girls, because you're so in control. You're so in control on every aspect of your life. You're controlling multi-million rand budgets, you're controlling big teams of people, and here comes this little thing that you've got no control over. But I think that's also something where companies can be more progressive in how they assist working mothers. I couldn't have built my career without my husband. I think for women in business in particular who don't have a very supportive spouse and are single mums, I think it must be absolutely devastatingly hard and I take my hat off to them. I think it started becoming more real to me, imposter syndrome, 
the higher I got in my career, because then I really started to face and realize there were things that I didn't know and things that I couldn't necessarily do. So what I did to counter that is I got some sideline coaching. And in fact, with a journalist, I went to see one of the top uh, financial editors and he gave me some pointers. And then I thought, no, I must also surround myself with people that know more than me, are better than me, and let them do that part. Let me do what I'm good at doing. I landed up at the top of my career being Chief Comms Officer for Vodacom Group. But I was on an assignment in my consulting capacity at Old Mutual. I was with them for 18 months. And we did a workshop there on unconscious bias. And I relayed the story about how I just walk into a room and I just assume things are going to go my way. And it's just that it's a natural thing that I do. And then one of my black colleagues said she has never had that feeling. She's never walked into a room and assumed that things are going to go her way. And I realized I have this unconscious bias. I have to be sensitive to my privilege. I have to be sensitive of the power that I have when I walk into a room, the power of my confidence. I suppose it is really that that power that that has helped me along my journey.